Good afternoon and thank you for joining this same webinar on invasive non-native species. We're just going to start with a few notices as we're waiting for everyone to join the webinar. The Spring Conference is going to be in London on the 22nd of March. Um, and bookings are now open. So member rates range from £30 for students to £145 for full fellow associate and graduate members of SAIM. Pleased to announce that the keynote speaker will be Tony Juniper. And we have a number of other speakers who are now confirmed who are going to be exploring the business case for creating opportunities for biodiversity, resolving conflicts that can arise, and demonstrating how architects, engineers, landscape designers, and ecologists can work together to deliver biodiverse urban environments. We're going to start the webinar in just a moment. If you want to ask a question during the webinar, you should be able to either tap or click at the very top of your screen and you'll see a Q&A button appear in that top corner. When you click on the Q&A button, a little screen will appear where you can type your question in. And then you just need to press send to submit your question. Max and Mark will be joining us or staying on at the end of the webinar to answer questions that are posed um, and we'll be doing that as an audio, posing the questions to them and then providing their answers verbally. There's also going to be a short recap at the end of the webinar where questions will appear on screen for you to answer. You just need to click or tap on yes or no to answer each bunch of questions. There'll be three or four questions coming at a time. So that gives me great pleasure to pass across to Max Wade and Mark Fennell, who are going to be giving us a presentation on invasive non-native species, the law, regulations and policy in the UK and Ireland. And this will, this will be a webinar which will help you to keep out of jail. Okay, Max and Mark, you should be able to share your screen now. Okay, so we're just uh, doing that now. So brilliant. Yes, and sharing. So good afternoon, everybody. <coughs> this is Max Max Wade, um, and I, I have here with me Mark Mark Paul. Mark, Mark. Um, invasive non-native species, it's uh, a key um, aspect of our work as ecologists at the moment, uh, one of the key aspects in terms of um, ecosystems and biodiversity. And our session uh, this afternoon is to look at some of the basic aspects in relation to uh, the law, um, regulations and policy as it affects the uh, work we do. Now, in order to be a safe driver and uh, comply with the law, uh, I'm sure most of you have probably gone through the process of uh, being a learner driver, etc. And we learn to abide by speed limits, um, drive safely in all sorts of different ways. Uh, but actually, we probably haven't got the first idea of what is the legislation that governs um, the way in which we drive and the rules and, and regulations. So it is with uh, invasive species. Uh, there's, there's a lot we can do that will keep us uh, within the law, um, some basic, basic things that we'll talk about um, to start off with this afternoon, um, which hopefully will um, enable you to undertake the work you carry out with invasive species um, safely and, and appropriately. Um, <clears throat> uh, as a driver, I certainly don't want to break the law. Um, there are some sort of fines and uh, uh, all sorts of um, in, in positions if I do that. Uh, equally, we don't want to get into trouble or our clients get into trouble um, if we break the law in relation to invasive species. And uh, certainly over the last few years, uh, a number of um, solicitors' practices um, have taken a particular interest in, in this particular area. I think equally, um, we should be aware there are certain aspects of invasive species 
management that uh, perhaps at, at this stage uh, we should leave to uh, other specialists. So for example, uh, you're not going to hop into an articulated lorry and go for a spin. Uh, that is uh, down to somebody with a heavy goods vehicle license uh, who's going to undertake that. And certainly that applies to um, managing invasive species. A good start is to define your site. Uh, the area in which you're working could be um, a small um, development site, could be up to sort of the size of a nature reserve, could be a national park. Um, these areas uh, are important. So legislation, policy, guidance refer to uh, the site, uh, the area that, that you're responsible for. What, what, you know, where are your responsibilities? Understand the bounds uh, that you need to work within. Uh, but equally then also what's without those uh, boundaries uh, which could be uh, affect the work that you do. Now it's really important to be careful uh, working with invasive species um, for yourself and those uh, you're responsible for. Uh, they, <clears throat> they do live in some um, tricky places, um, deep water, uh, isolated urban sites, um, railway lines, and of themselves, they can be uh, quite nasty. Uh, Jan Hogweed, not to be messed with. Uh, oak processionary moth, definitely not to be messed with. <coughs> and Himalayan porcupine, well, if you're lucky to come across one, uh, again, really uh, be careful. And it could be that the management that you undertake could involve you in um, applying herbicides and chemicals. You could be shooting things, you could be trapping things. Uh, these are just a few of the and the hazards that, that are possibly uh, you're going to encounter. Um, so do uh, work safe, uh, make sure that um, you're, you're clear. <clears throat> so uh, another aspect of uh, making sure that you are on the right side of the, the legislation, even if you aren't necessarily fully aware of, of every particular piece of legislation, is to carry out your site assessments in a, in a thorough and rigorous manner. And um, so kind of the, the first thing that you, you need to think about is, um, are you aware of the, the plants and animals that are, that are relevant to the habitat in which you are working? Or if, if you aren't up to date uh, with, with all plants and animals for which legislation is relevant, to make it clear uh, to whom you are carrying out the survey for that you are only surveying for say maybe plants, or animals or a specific plant. And it, it also in terms of protecting yourself uh, and your client against uh, future breaches of legislation uh, is identifying pathways. The legislation is very much focused on prevention of spread. So you need to identify the pathways that can both facilitate the spread of invasives around a site, but also off of a site or even onto a site as well. So identifying invasive species spread pathways is quite important. Um, checking for species in the site's environs as well. So it's not that the survey shouldn't end at the, the red line boundary, and this is coming back to what Max said about defining the site, uh, that it's quite important to consider um, species that are present just beyond the boundary, for if you take all the care in the world to control the species within a boundary property, but don't deal with the species outside of it, the problem will come back pretty quickly. And also making records uh, of your site assessment and all of the relevant information that you come across. The, the basic here being obviously lots of photographs, ideally um, with an element of time stamping or, or GIS included or GPS included, and photographs of uh, potential risks like the photograph there where you have a tire track going over a Himalayan balsam plant. Uh, so to make sure you record all of the potential risks on a site. Um, and then to take precautions immediately to prevent spread. So this includes taking precautions yourself during uh, a site visit, but also providing information to the landowner or client about what they need to do immediately. Uh, as I'm sure people are aware, it often takes maybe a few weeks to deliver a, a report uh, following a site inspection. So you need to make the client aware of things that they need to do right away. And in terms of biosecurity, what you need to do yourself, um, plan, check, clean, dry. I'm sure you've all heard that mantra before, but it's exceptionally important 
Um, research from the Arctic and Antarctic have shown that field workers are one of the leading vectors of spread uh, into certain areas due to the presence of propagules on footwear, or equipment, clothing. So making sure to, to keep your, yourself and your, your, your clothing and your, your equipment clean is very important. Uh, Installing a fence to prevent the spread of a species around a site uh, can be a, a massively effective way of juice, reducing the risk of spread. Uh, it doesn't have to be a great wall, it just needs to be an effective barrier uh, with clear signage so that people know that they're not supposed to cross this line without taking appropriate precautions. Um, and also providing advice to the landowner about communicating restrictions to, to ground maintenance. You don't want somebody coming along and flaying a big pile of uh, giant hogweed or, or Japanese knotweed, um, or somebody accidentally spraying an invasive plant in a way that could actually make its uh, ultimate control more difficult. And one of the, the key factors in carrying out your works in a way that keeps you within the law uh, and keeps you uh, safe and not committing offences is to make sure that you have a, a proper paper trail uh, and typically in the form of a management plan. So a, a, a well-used mantra in terms of legislation, and I'll just read it out, it shall be a defence to a charge of committing an offence to prove that the accused took all reasonable steps and exercised all due diligence to avoid committing the offence. So if you can prove that you've taken all reasonable steps not to commit an offence, you will be protected. Um, so this management plan, which clearly outlines the objectives of your survey, and clearly outlines your findings, and clearly outlines recommendations that follow best practice and take into consideration uh, all relevant legislation, uh, is very important. And this way you can demonstrate that the work has been carried out um, with due diligence. So, uh we're off to a good start. Um, our management plan um, will deal with preventative measures. Um, if necessary, uh, we, we're prepared and able to undertake a rapid response. That refers to um, the first occasion that you may have a plant occurring or an animal occurring on the site. Uh, you can deal with it <coughs> quickly and efficiently. We're looking to cooperate uh, where appropriate, both on biosecurity and the control measures working with our neighbours, for example, uh, maybe in housing, uh, residential area. But at the same time, uh, we're looking to grow the information on pathway identification. Uh, we're looking for early warning signs, uh, and again, the ability to undertake a, a rapid response. Following um, the procedures that are occurring, uh, certainly at countrywide, uh, national and EU levels, uh, risk assessments uh, are really important uh, and we should be thinking um, of applying these at, at the site level. So what are the actual risks associated with the animal or the plant that, that you've encountered and making decisions appropriately? All of this uh, will lead you to a comprehensive and integrated approach uh, which at the end of the day means you're much more likely to be able to deal with the problem uh, and certainly to make sure that uh, you've discharged your responsibilities uh, as best as you can. And these responsibilities <coughs> emanate uh, from uh, a number of pieces of legislation and, and regulation. An important one to start off with is the European Regulation on Invasive Alien Species. Um, 2015 uh, was when it entered uh, into force and, and it seeks to address the problem of invasive alien species uh, in a comprehensive manner um, an approach that we've talked about already, um, so as to protect native biodiversity and ecosystems, but goes further than that in terms of looking uh, to protect human health, economic impacts, uh, and so on. So it uh, um, is a very comprehensive piece of legislation and recognises the importance of prevention, early warning and rapid response, and the need for management. It relates to a list of species, species of European Union concern, um, 23 animals, 14 plants uh, that have been identified um, have gone through a risk assessment process um, and are uh, likely, if not managed, to cause adverse effects uh, across the EU. 
Um, this regulation um, imposes restrictions on member states um, in terms of these species of, of union concern and associated with that are strict restrictions uh, that apply to these species. They cannot be imported, bred, sold, allowed to reproduce <coughs> or released into the environment. Uh, and the regulation seeks uh, to achieve an information system for early uh, warning and rapid response across the uh, member states, improve cooperation and biosecurity and control measures, um, into integrating all of this into other um, policy areas within the EU, and forming, a, again, a comprehensive, uh, dedicated EU legal instrument, um, considering also predictive effects of climate change, trying to future-proof um, the changes that will occur in relation to these plants and animals. It's a very um, mobile situation, uh, new plants, new animals uh, coming up. Um, <coughs> the uh, list of species of EU concern is likely to be revised this year or next year with other species added to it. Um, so in terms of the um, key aspects, uh, and it's well worth having a look at DEFRA's frequently asked questions page, um, what this means in terms of uh, landowners, um, clients, etc., is they must act responsibly and not allow or encourage uh, these plants or animals to grow or spread outside their land. Uh, this could be an offence. Where this cannot be guaranteed, um, they're encouraged to consider safely removing and disposing of any listed plant. Regulation does not impose any obligations to eradicate any listed animal. However, as under existing the, uh, um, UK legislation, if you were to release it or allow it to escape into the world, again, that could be uh, an offence. Now, you could well be thinking, okay, EU regulation, Brexit, it's, you know, all this is, doesn't really mean, it, mean anything to us. I think, first off, uh, it's important to recognise that um, we um, are bound by um, these legal obligations and, until we have left uh, the EU, which could be a little while yet. Uh, and also, um, do bear in mind, secondly, that uh, it's quite likely that um, we will enshrine some of these, at least some of these aspects in our own uh, legislation, uh, which is the whole idea of the EU regulation. Um, uh, member states actually pick it up in their own legislation where it then actually affects and has a, a, an impact um, on landowners uh, and others. So that frequently asked questions uh, document by DEFRA is a, is, it's a good read and it also includes the, that list of uh, species of union concern as well uh, so that you can add those to the uh, little bookmarks you have in any IT guides that you might carry around. Uh, so the next one's an oldie but a goldie. The Wildlife and Countryside Act has been around for a while uh, 1981 is when it was first came into force, uh, but it has been amended by various different uh, legislation since then. And currently, there's a, a list of approximately 100 plants and animals uh, for which there are specific um, regulations about their 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 spread uh, in the wild. Uh, so it's it's reasonably reasonably simple, basically. Uh, for plants, in any case, you can plant or otherwise cause to grow in the wild any plant listed on Schedule 9. So that's about 40 species, uh, certainly worth familiarizing yourself with them. Um, and then you also have uh, any animal listed on Schedule 9 and um, can't be released or allowed to escape into the wild, uh, or also any animal that's not ordinarily resident in Great Britain. Uh, so that's uh, the Wildlife and Countryside Act, um, and that's the primary piece of legislation currently in, in England and Wales. So basically, you can't spread invasive species around in the wild. Uh, the definition of the wild uh, is in a slide later on, which you can read at your leisure. Um, another key piece of legislation in the, in the UK, in England and Wales, is the Infrastructure Act 2015. Um, and this has given government really important tools uh, needed to tackle invasive species. So with the Wildlife and Countryside Act, um, there's nothing that can be used to make a landowner deal with invasive species on their property. And um, so if you do have a high-risk species, 
there's not a lot of government can do to make you do something about it uh, until the Infrastructure Act came into force and that introduced two new types of um, power to government, uh, species control agreements, uh, where a statutory agency sets out the terms of a voluntary agreement with a landowner, uh, provides steps to control an invasive species, and works with them to tackle the problem. Um, so that's a, a fairly simple and straightforward approach. Um, and then one step up from that, you have species control orders. So should a landowner refuse to enter into a species control agreement, or if they breach the terms of a species control agreement, and, or, or if it was a really urgent situation, like suddenly an Asian uh, hornet was spotted in a particular location, um, then a, a species control <coughs> order could be issued um, which compels the landowner to take specified steps to control the species. And if they don't, uh, it compels them to allow the environmental authority to enter their land to undertake the steps required to deal with the risk. Uh, and where the, the introduction of the species is the fault of the landowner, they may very well find themselves responsible for the cost. So if the landowner introduced the species, um, the, the, the cost might fall on them for control, even if uh, an environmental authority carries out the works. So you might have been thinking, um, why just um, the flags of, of England and Wales on the, on the previous screen? Uh, well, uh, gold star to Scotland, uh, Scotland uh, through the Wildlife and Natural Environment Scotland Act of 2011, note the year, uh, and really set, all, set up all of this up um, uh, much earlier on. Um, the Wildlife and Countryside Act uh, applies to Scotland, uh, but the, and it's known as the Wayne Act, uh, made amendments to uh, the Wildlife and Countryside Act <coughs> such that now there is a legal presumption against releasing any animals or plants into the wild outside of their, their native range. Uh, really uh, quite far reaching uh, at, at that particular time to uh, have to a certain extent second guess uh, the EU regulation. So under the Wayne Act it's an offence uh, to plant or otherwise cause to grow a plant in the wild at a place out with its uh, native range. Uh, it's also an offence to release or to allow to escape from captivity any animal to a place again out, out with its, its native range. Um, <clears throat> and just to emphasise, these are any animals or, or plants uh, that fall into this particular category. The Lane Act introduced um, species notifications. It made it a lot easier. Um, the Wildlife and Countryside Act does include and a provision for the prohibit, prohibition of sale of, uh, of plants and animals, but the way that just made that uh, a lot easier. And also, um, just as Mark was talking about on the uh, previous screen, um, it includes provision for species control orders. One of the, the key reasons that uh, Scotland felt the necessity to have it as any plant or animal out with their native range was due to issues they were having with some native species on islands off the coast of Scotland. Um, in Northern Ireland, the, the matter is uh, basically the same as in England and Wales. Uh, you have the Wildlife Orders 1985 um, that are pretty much analogous to the Wildlife and Countryside Act. And in the same way, you can't release or allow to escape uh, any animal into the wild that's not ordinarily resident or is listed on Schedule 9. And you can't plant or otherwise cause to grow in the wild any plant listed on Schedule 9 of the Act. So it's uh, pretty much the same as England and Wales. Uh, in Ireland, uh, the, the situation is slightly different. And if anything, the regulations are more strict than in the UK. So through statutory instrument number 477, catchy title, um, there are pretty stringent rules in relating to prevent uh, the spread of invasive species. So whereas uh, for plants in the, in the UK, it was plant or otherwise cause to grow, in the Republic of Ireland, it's plant, disperse, allow, or cause to disperse, uh, spread or otherwise cause to grow any plant included in part one of the third schedule, so that's their version of Schedule 9, throughout the state. So they're not even just restricting it to the wild, it's anywhere in the Republic of Ireland you can't allow an invasive plant to disperse. 
Uh, so that creates more of an incentive on spread within urban environments, uh, which might be of particular interest. And also, uh, the regulations relating to animals are, 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 are very similar to those in the rest of the UK. Um, breed, reproduce, or release, or allow to call to disperse or escape uh, from confinement any animal not ordinarily resident uh, or listed on that third schedule as well. And interestingly, uh, the Article 50 of this particular uh, piece of legislation uh, puts restrictions on the transportation of um, vectors for uh, invasive species and they specifically mention soils containing Japanese knotweed or giant, knot, giant knotweed or, or the hybrid knotweed um, uh, included in this uh, part three of schedule of the third schedule. Um, so there are restrictions on the transportation and on the sale of all species listed in this third schedule. So what about waste? As, as Max uh, mentioned earlier, you wouldn't hop in an articulated lorry and start driving around. Uh, and in the same way, you wouldn't start, I hope, you wouldn't start moving invasive species waste around the countryside and disposing of it uh, without making sure all of the I's were dotted and T's were crossed. Um, environmental or waste legislation is extremely complicated and necessarily so. Uh, the logical end point of not having strong regulation is play fields filled with needles and used diapers. Uh, so you can see why you would need uh, very strict rules regulating how you can transport uh, and, uh, and uh, dispose of waste. Uh, and the, the rules are, are largely similar across the UK and Northern Ireland uh, in that uh, more or less a uh, government has uh, decided that invasive species uh, should be considered as controlled waste, uh, typically non-hazardous controlled waste, uh, if you're dealing with sort of the, the, the usual suspects like uh, Japanese knotweed and giant hogweed and the soils containing their property deals. But for other species uh, listed on legislation, like certain aquatic species, uh, they may just be classified as uh, green waste, but that is still a type of controlled waste. And so you need to determine uh, what the duty of care and the proper disposal route is for the species that you're um, dealing with, and then also make sure that you have the appropriate licenses or you're using a, a, a waste carrier with the appropriate license and the material is going to a landfill facility with the appropriate license. And there are very strict duties of care uh, in place for that. Uh, in the Republic of Ireland, uh, the situation is, is evolving somewhat um, on account of some of the complexities associated with that statutory instrument, uh, but they do have similar waste management regulations to those in the UK, uh, i.e. you are likely to require a license for the transport and disposal of waste containing uh, invasive species. So contact the National Parks and Wildlife Service before you do so. Last uh, piece of legislation uh, to draw your attention to uh, are common law and the Anti-Social Behaviour Crime and Policing Act. But these uh, aim to deal with the sort of nuisance sort of community issues that are generated <coughs> um, up till now, uh, particularly by plants such as Japanese knotweed. Um, the legislation um, is relatively broad and deliberately so. Common law uh, covers a, a whole a range of different types of situations of private nuisance, <coughs> but um, is increasingly being used by uh, a property owner who, for some reason or other, um, um, has maybe it's to do with diminution of the value of their property due to, say, Japanese not weed on the next door neighbour's land, disagreements in terms of management, etc. Common law, uh, as I say, is being quite widely used. Uh, in 2014, um, Home Office introduced uh, the idea that um, invasive uh, non-native plants could be included within the Antisocial Behaviour Crime and Policing Act um, and um, gave powers to local councils and police, well they, they have the power already, but they added to that um, that they could issue community protection notices against um, individuals who were, and importantly, uh, it's, they were acting unreasonably and persistently or continually uh, in a way that had a detrimental effect 
uh, on the quality of life of those uh, in the locality, the community. Um, valuable pieces of legislation, um, much um, needed at, at the local level. So, um, mentioned earlier, we don't want to uh, end up getting a speeding fine <coughs> or um, not having taxed our, um, our car or whatever. Um, equally, uh, there's a, a range of um, punishments, etc. if uh, one doesn't carry out uh, measures appropriately in relation to invasive species. Uh, you can read through these um, at your leisure, the Wildlife and Countryside Act through the Magistrates Court, £5,000 fine, uh, all the way through a Crown Court with two years imprisonment. Breaching a community protection notice, not quite so exciting, uh, and uh, a hundred pound on the spot penalty. But if you're a company or a business, uh, you can be fined up to twenty thousand pounds. So um, worth taking seriously. Um, not uh, the real reason uh, for, for making sure we follow the legislation, um, regulations, etc. Uh, but certainly worth bearing in mind. Um, at the end of the day, um, as we've covered already, um, it is a defence to a charge of committing an offence. Uh, that you took all reasonable steps and exercised all due diligence uh, to avoid committing the offence. And I think a reason for repeating this is that um, we are in a relatively new area. Uh, we're in an area that's changing quite rapidly uh, in terms of legislation, best practice, and how we deal with these plants and animals. Uh, and this is likely to remain uh, an area of change in, into the future. So it is important that we do our best, uh, and as uh, Mark described earlier, you need an invasive species management plan to wrap all that up, um, make sure you've done as good a job as you can, and if things go wrong, uh, you can use it in your defence. Have a read in your own time through the definitions here on native range and the wild. Um, sort of useful to have a, a perspective. Um, there are two aspects of the uh, overall process that have, 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 have dogged certainly the Wildlife and Countryside Act. Um, but uh, you, you have a, those for a record to have a look at. And also to encourage you to um, look um, on the GB uh, Non-Native Species Secretariat website. It's an excellent website, um, not just for legislation, but a whole range of other things keep you up to date with uh, non-native species in, uh, in Great Britain. And in terms of the Republic of, of Ireland, <coughs> Invasive Species Ireland, also a really good website, uh, even you know, if you're in, in Great Britain, well worth having a look. It's got some uh, very useful resources, uh, again, in addition to legislation. Uh, if you were to pop on to the uh, Non-Native Species Secretary website, uh, you would see that um, our webinar has only covered uh, the main aspects. Uh, you would see legislation relating to crayfish, you'd see the Bees Act, You'd see the um, Water Framework Directive. Uh, you'd see a whole range of, of other aspects, and that's before we even get into uh, aspects in terms of handling chemicals, uh, herbicides, for example, uh, going around shooting things, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, there is a whole panoply uh, of legislation, uh, but hopefully what we've covered um, this afternoon um, equips you to make sure that dealing with invasive species uh, you, you're able to do a good job, um, cover yourself, and make sure you don't uh, commit any certainly serious errors, and also to give you uh, an insight into the sort of essential legislation that, that drives uh, an awful lot of, of, of what we do. So um, the, the next portion of the, 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 the presentation, that's, that's basically the end of the, the information portion. Um, and now as a, as a summary and just to, to get you thinking uh, about how you have been carrying out uh, activities, uh, site assessments uh, in respect to invasive species, there's a series of, of 10 questions now. And it's hoped that if you can answer yes to all 10 of these, that you'll be carrying out the works, in a, uh, carrying out your works in a, in a, in a responsible and professional, professional manner. So when you are answering these, uh, rather answer in respect to what you've been doing previously rather than what you would do in the real world moving forward. Uh, so the first three questions are, do you account for relevant health and safety implications? So do you make yourself aware and everybody 
that you're responsible for, aware of the health and safety issues with dealing with certain invasives? Um, have you been defining the site that you are responsible for? Um, and are you, have you been aware of your various legal responsibilities uh, relating to preventing spread? Fantastic. Thanks, Mark. I'm just going to launch that poll now. Um, so participants should be able to just use the click or tap on their screen to work through those three questions and then submit their answers. We'll share their responses with you before we move on to the next three. Uh, sounds good. There's still quite a lot of votes coming in, so I'm just going to give it another 10 seconds to uh, Okay, I'm just going to finish the polling now. And uh, it's looking like everyone's uh, on the majority of people. Uh, confidently answering yes there. I'm just going to share those results with you. We've got 96% responding yes to the first one, 96 to the second, and 92 to the third. Okay, that's very, very good. So um, those of you who are in the 4% the uh, of people uh, on the other side of the barrier there, just to uh, to to you know, take what you've uh, gone through today and uh, maybe try and integrate it into uh, your, your, your safe work practices. So looking at the next three questions, um, <clears throat> perhaps the, the first one is less likely to achieve such a high, high result. Are you familiar with all relevant species? Uh, you might like to think of those in terms of species that you are likely to encounter in, in the work that you do, rather than all the relevant species are listed on the uh, schedules for the Wildlife and Countryside Act and the species of EU concern. But uh, you know, are you familiar with the, uh, the relevant species? Would you be able to uh, recognise them um, <clears throat> if you saw them? Um, are you taking all necessary biosecurity precautions? Uh, are you absolutely sure that uh, when, when you're out in the field, uh, you're, you're behaving in a way that minimizes the risk of, of, of any spread. And then uh, the sixth question, uh, are you prepared to execute a rapid response? Brilliant, Thanks. thank you Mike. I'm just going to uh, launch those so that people can have a look at the answers, and <coughs> pose their answers. Okay, just going to give it another about 10 seconds for the last few votes to come in. Okay, I'm going to stop the uh, survey then and I can just share those results with you. So, slightly more mixed with 50% uh, familiar with all relevant species, 69% taking all necessary biosecurity precautions and 56% prepared to execute a rapid response. Max and Mark, I'll pass back across to you. Okay, so um, perhaps not that unexpected, um, it's quite hard work to keep up with the identification of these species, um, but certainly keep your eyes open uh, in terms of training opportunities at uh, work. You know, with each other within your own organisations to share your, share your experience. Clearly, being able to recognise these species and 
even better to pass on your records, building up uh, this sort of picture of distribution is really important. Uh, equally, biosecurity precautions can be a bit tedious, can be a bit you know, irksome, but it's, it's really important. So um, try, try that bit harder, get a bit, uh, bit of better planning um, and, and, and sensible approaches uh, can, can make a huge difference. Certainly with the rapid response, do bear in mind that your clients probably have got quite a bit to do here. Have they undertaken the uh, sort of procurement? Can they make decisions at short notice in terms of spending the necessary money um, that's going to be needed for a, for a rapid response rather than them all looking at each other around the table as to who's going to put the bill and it takes about another three or four weeks before they, they decide. So uh, do, do bear in mind the rapid response isn't just your ability to get out there. Um, it's the ability of your, your clients to, uh, to respond as well. I think also uh, <coughs> a good identification book, and you'll see uh, on the, the references list that's circulated, there's a few recommendations for identification guides that you can have a look at. Uh, so, so make sure you, you, you look through that reference list and get yourself some good identification material as well. The, uh, the, re the references list will follow on after the, um, uh, after the webinar. And also with, with, with biosecurity, uh, for those who are ecologists here, that um, probably going to sensitive areas, maybe even at the weekend, uh, you really don't want to be the one spreading these species around and mixing those populations, increasing genetic diversity in these different populations, even if you know there's already a species in a location. That doesn't mean don't clean your, your footwear. Uh, so the last few questions here. Um, can you write or recommend someone who can write a fit for a purpose invasive species management plan, so one that takes into account all relevant legislation. Uh, are you in or can you recommend a contractor in a suitable trade association if you're involved with control or recommending somebody to carry out control? Uh, do you know the relevant government organization to contact for advice if you, if you have a question, say, about waste disposal? Uh, and are you up to date with legislation policy and guidance. So do you check those two websites that we listed on a semi-regular basis to see what new species have, have come in or maybe new species have been added and all that kind of stuff. Fantastic, thanks Mark. So I'm just going to make those questions live now so that uh, people can start responding. Okay, so we're just going to give that one another 10 seconds. A few responses still coming in. Okay, and I'm going to end that now so we can again share the results. 81% uh, be able to or able to recommend someone to write a fit for purpose invasive species management plan. 61% in a suitable trade association are able to recommend a contractor who is. 81% who know the relevant government organisation to contact for advice and 60% who feel up to date with legislation policy and guidance. Okay so I mean for a lot of those 10 checkpoints uh, most of you seem to be pretty confident and, and that's great. Uh, uh, about half of the, the 10 checkpoints seem to be hovering around the 60% the mark. So there's probably certain areas where you can uh, brush up your skills uh, so that you can carry out a, a better, safer, more responsible uh, piece of work. So that's the, the end of the 10-point the ten, ten, ten checklist. Uh, I don't know, do we have time for, for questions? Yeah, we have got a few questions come in, Max and Mark. So if you've got five minutes, um, it would be nice to be able to answer some of these um, over, over the air. 
Um, yep. Just got one point made by Jenny Neff. She's just um, highlighted that the Invasive Species Island websites and all island sites for both the Republic of Ireland um, and Northern Ireland. So I just think that might be a useful point to share. Oh, yes. With everyone. Uh, the, the Invasive Species Island website has great advice both for you know, legislation in the Republic and, and Northern Bank border. Brilliant. Okay, so I'm going to start off with a question that's come in um, from Sue Sell. She's asking, how does Wayne cover gardening? And then there's also, I think, a related question from Graham Davison, who's asked, are garden plants like cotoneasters that are growing in a garden in the wild for the purposes of uh, the WACA 1981? Are they listed under Schedule 9 Part 2? Um, yeah, so the, the definition of the wild is, is a little bit grey and has to be uh, accounted for on a site-by-site -site basis, but typically people's back gardens would be excluded in the wild, um, with the exception that if a, even a managed property, and this is based on a, 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 a guidance document produced by DEFRA in 2010, that even on, on managed land, so so, so properties that would typically be excluded from the wild, like a back garden or uh, some larger uh, grounds, um, if it's allowed to enter a wild state, i.e. the species aren't being carefully kept in check, then that could constitute the, uh, that location being the wild. And therefore, if you allow the species to spread around in that location, it may be an offence. But if you are keeping the back garden uh, carefully in check, then no, it wouldn't be classified as the wild, and movement around that garden wouldn't be classified as a facilitating spread in the wild. However, allowing it to spread from a garden into an adjacent, say, woodland, uh, would potentially constitute an offence, as would if you were working in a woodland, uh, which was the wild, and you moved it from one location in the woodland to another, that would be an offence. But interestingly, if you had a woodland adjacent to a private back garden and it spread from the woodland into the garden, that probably wouldn't be an offence. Fantastic. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Joe Underhill's asked if you could clarify what's meant by a rapid response. The idea of rapid response is um, to be able to is to be ready to deal with um, a new invasion um, in a quick and efficient manner. So I think the the two um, so case studies that are, are, are generally referred to are water primrose. Um, so the Environment Agency, in conjunction with DEFRA, um, have undertaken a rapid response um, and uh, with the aim of eradicating water primrose from um, the UK. So um, controlling the plant, eradicating the plant from ponds and other, uh, other locations. Uh, the other rapid response um, was uh, in the knowledge that the Asian hornet um, has been um, hovering. I don't know whether they hover, they seem to perhaps be more like fighter, pilot, fighter jets. Um, but uh, it has been uh, <coughs> imminently um, imminent to arrive in this country. Uh, again, DEFRA undertook a, to prepare a rapid response. It appeared remarkably in Gloucestershire for the first time, but um, the, the preparations had been made in order to deal with the um, with this insect uh, on its arrival. Um, as I referred in the presentation, um, that's at a sort of a national level. You could be work you could be working in a nature reserve. Um, you could be working for a client with a large, um, large land asset, such as National Grid, for example. Um, if they were to um, find an animal or plant, or you were to find an animal or plant on their land, or on your land in the nature reserve, um, it's the ability to deal with it uh, rapidly, to respond uh, rapidly, uh, that will be a rapid response. So it doesn't have to be at a national level, it could be at, at the local site level, uh, but it's really important um, once these uh, plants are established, and these animals are established, they will, they will start to move and spread. And it just becomes more difficult um, on that site to affect control. And also they've then got the, the, the scope to move to other sites. So that all sort of fits into the importance of surveillance and, and prevention that the legislation focuses on. 
Uh, so, so a new species arrives, you've already come up with a methodology for managing it, for dealing it, for eradicating it, uh, and you've already talked to the client about setting aside funds for implementing the pre-designed method for eradication uh, and uh, it had a process in place that allows all this, all these decisions to be made very quickly. So you're not coming at it from scratch and ooh, where will we get the funding and all that kind of stuff. We've been, we've been very good over the last decades at all standing <laughs> watching New Zealand pygmy weeds and Himalayan porcupines and various things and all going, oh, look at that, you know, somebody ought to have done something about that. Um, rapid response is very much a, an attempt to do that. Fantastic. Um, just a couple more for you, uh, Max and Mark. Uh, Laura White asked, if managed properties back onto natural waterways and invasive plants may not be able to spread out of the garden physically, but their seed dispersal reaches the watercourses, are they still liable? Oh, almost certainly not. It, it would be remarkable if um, <coughs> The police, because we do need to remind ourselves in the case of the Wildlife and Countryside Act, it's the police who uh, actually enforce it. So, you know, for the uh, police to have worked out that that had happened and that it had come to your garden and to knock on your door and uh, <coughs> be rescued uh, seems extremely unlikely. I think here, uh, what I'd encourage is the use of this sort of idea of a risk assessment. So, um, to have something in your garden, in your in the pond, for example, um, that if it were to uh, get out into the canal or the stream or the reservoir where you live, um, if, if that's adjacent, if that if that's possible, um, <clears throat> then the risk is really quite high, uh, and it would not be a good idea to um, have have a, a plant like that uh, with an animal, if it's uh, pets and things that you're you're keeping exotic pets. Um, for instance, would be uh, in terms of Ketoniaster, which is quite a commonly asked question. You know, should we all be eradicating Ketoniasters in our gardens because they're on Schedule 9 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act? Well, no, of course not. But um, if, you, um, if you go down to Gower uh, and see the um, disruption, the environmental disruption um, and um, deterioration that's occurred as a result of Ketoniasta getting into some of the communities down there, then um, it, it would have been a very good idea not to have Ketoniasta in gardens um, and uh, landscaping etc in that part of the world. So it's um, making sensible decisions based on an, an assessment of the risk. And also considering so the, the habitat in which the propagules might be being introduced, is it suitable uh, for the species to, to establish and enter an invasive state, but also is that species already present uh, outside uh, within, say, that water course? Uh, it's already in the wild, so you can't really facilitate the spread into the wild in, in, in a meaningful sense. Okay, uh, Mark and Max, just the final question I'm going to ask you. Um, it's come from Julie Batty, and she's asked, under the EU regs, is there scope for member states or countries like Scotland to focus or draw up a more local list of species of concern causing specific issues at a local level? No, I think is the simple answer. <laughs> um, um, however, it's quite an it's an interesting question because part of the discussion and it'll be interesting to see whether things change in the future um, was that it might have been more appropriate to have had regional lists, a number of regional lists for the EU, rather than having one list for the whole of the EU, if you follow me. So um, that could be um, a, a way things might move in the future. It depends on um, the success of the uh, invasive alien species regulation, but uh, that was certainly a, a, a significant discussion point. Um, so it's a you know, perceptive question. Fantastic. Uh, Mark and Max, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. We have got a lot of questions coming in, so we've generated a lot of interest. Um, and we will be circulating the list of resources and web links that you've sent to us, which hopefully people can use to help answer some of those queries. Um, a few people have asked if the presentation will be available after um, the end of the webinar. 
We've actually made a recording of the webinar itself, so you'll be able to review the slides by looking at that recording, which will be available on our website in the next, within the next week. So we'll be sending out links to that um, to attendees so that you can navigate your way to find the webinar um, and re recap if you've got particular slides that you want to go back and have a look at. <clears throat> Sure, and if, uh, if there's a sufficient number of questions to warrant maybe a, a repeat webinar, webinar where we literally just go through top queries of people working with invasive species and who attended this webinar, if that was possible or desired. Thanks so much, Mark. That's brilliant. Uh, let, let's um, talk about that and see if we uh, if there's scope for us to set up something like that. That sounds really, really interesting. A way to pick up um, questions, something we've really not to with you. Okay, so it just really remains to thank Max and Mark very much for their time this afternoon um, and for such an interesting tour of non-native species. Uh, just a couple of final housekeeping points. As I said, we will be emailing out a resources list um, this afternoon and together with that there'll be a link to provide feedback on the webinar. We're very interested to receive your comments and thoughts on the webinar process as well as the content of the presentation. So do keep an eye out for that and uh, send us your comments. Also, if you want to record this webinar in your CPD record, it will be recorded under structured CPD and the competency, the relevant competencies of P4, M6 and HS1. Don't forget that you can easily do that by going into the My CPD tool, putting in the details of the website, of the webinar, and then you can select down to choose the relevant competencies on the screen that you've got. <laughs> Thanks very much for joining this webinar. We hope that you've enjoyed it and that you'll be able to join future sessions at lunchtime to find out about a range of different topics that are coming up in our webinar series. Thank you very much, and Max and Mark, thank you for your time. Bye-bye.